I'm David Korn. And I'm Jim Pinkerton. And together we're Blogging Heads TV. <laughs> Welcome. Welcome. Actually, uh, and a special edition of Blogging Heads TV because we're men with ties. <laughs> I was noticing this the other day. Mickey, Bob, Matt Iglesias, these guys barely even shave when they do this show. <laughs> Mickey looks like he crawled out of bed and just pushed the button on the, on the computer. Is his whole life in front of the cam? I don't... Um, in Washington, we do things differently, don't we? In, in what, right, exactly. And we are more conscious of being on a real TV channel and the chance that we might be called at any moment, so we want to wear a tie. And we're doing what we can to, to raise the average sartorial standard <laughs> here at Blogging Heads TV. The rest of you... So far with no success. The rest of you, please take note. Um, well, how was your week? Uh, it was fine, thanks. Uh, probably not as busy and intense as yours, but I'm glad that... You're able to make this Blogging Heads assignation because the Libby uh, jury was nice enough to render its verdict uh, and leave you free to do this. Yes, for those who don't know, I, I, I have been in a, in a disclosed location for, for the last two months. That is the media room at the U.S. Uh, District Courthouse here in Washington, uh, watching the Libby trial and then waiting for the uh, deliberations of the jury. Uh, they were gone for about 10 days, and so um, I was able to blog and write from that lovely media room full of journalists and fumes from the painting next door that was going on. Uh, but I'm glad to be sort of a, out in the open again, and I'm glad that the trial was done. So what did you learn? Well, we, we, we learned a lot. I mean, I think the big lesson is although conservatives don't want to acknowledge this, the system worked. Think about it for a moment. Uh, there was a leak uh, that appeared in Bob Novak's column saying two administration officials had identified a CIA officer uh, by name, Valerie Wilson, Valerie Plame, in that story. I was the first person to write an article suggesting, saying that there was a possibility that this leak might have violated a little-known statute called the Intelligence Identities Protection Act, uh, but that you couldn't know for sure unless there was an investigation. Uh, congressional Democrats, Chuck Schumer and others, you know, for the obvious reasons, jumped on this and called for investigation. The CIA conducted its own initial internal review. Uh, it took a couple, couple weeks, and then um, towards the end of the summer of 2003, sent a request to the Justice Department saying, we think there's enough here for you guys to investigate the, uh, the, the unauthorized disclosure of classified information. The, F, uh, this, the Justice Department, run by a guy named John Ashcroft, no lefty last time I checked, uh, said yes, started pursuing the investigation, and then John Ashcroft uh, decided to recuse himself from the case because it was targeting White House officials, including Karl Rove, and Karl Rove had even done campaign work once upon a time for John Ashcroft. So he recuses himself. His deputy picks a independent, tough-minded U.S. attorney out of Chicago, Patrick Fitzgerald, to run the investigation so no one can say it's political. Patrick Fitzgerald was even uh, nominated for the job by a Republican senator from Illinois, a fellow named Pete Fitzgerald, no, no relation and no longer a senator, not because of this, and then he starts investigating. Uh, he eventually comes to the conclusion that the Intelligence Identities Protection, Protection Act is a hard law, law to prosecute anybody under in this case because you have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the person leaking the information knew for sure that the person who was, who, whose identity was being leaked was indeed undercover at the CIA. And that, it's a hard thing to prove that sort of state of mind and that state of knowledge. But in the course of doing this investigation, Patrick Fitzgerald came to suspect that both Carl Rove and Scooter Libby had not told the truth to the FBI and the grand jury in charge of the, um, in charge of the case. You, you have to ask yourself, what is a prosecutor to do in that situation? And he has suggested more than once that he couldn't come to a final resolution of, uh, of whether to make a prosecution under the leak statute because he didn't think he had all the information regarding Dick Cheney's office and Scooter Libby. But nevertheless, is a prosecutor supposed to walk away from suspected perjury? What he did was to investigate further. He ended up deciding he didn't have a case against Karov. It doesn't seem to be the decision that a politically-minded zealot would, would reach if he was trying to destroy the White House. But he decided that Karov's story that he didn't remember 
his conversation with Matt Cooper about Valerie Wilson, you know, was something that you couldn't disprove in court. But with Scooter Libby, it was much different. Scooter Libby had given a very concrete uh, cover story, I think we can call it now, saying that he, and it was implausible, that he had heard, that he had learned from Dick Cheney that Valerie Wilson worked at the CIA. This is weeks before the Wilson affair became public. And then he, com and then he completely forgot about it. It's like in Gilligan's Island, the coconut hits you on the head, <laughs> and you have selective amnesia about only one fact. And then when Tim Russett tells him, well, he claims that Tim Russett told him about Valerie Wilson uh, a couple weeks later, and that he was now learning it anew, so anew that he was surprised to hear this. Now, the reason to do this was obvious. If he learned it as gossip from Tim Russert before the leak and then passed that information on to other reporters like Matt Cooper and Judy Miller, he could only be accused of passing gossip. Now, that is not a, a crime. So what Fitzgerald, though, discovered was that between the time that Cheney told him and the time that this Russert conversation supposedly happened, there were five or six, or actually more like eight or nine, witnesses who talked about conversations they had with Scooter Libby in which either they told him about Valerie Wilson or he told them about Valerie Wilson. And then Tim Russert denied he even had this conversation or told Scooter Libby this because he didn't know it at the time. You put all that together, and it looks like a pretty big cover story. So the question is, what does Patrick Fitzgerald, the prosecutor, do when you have a high-level government official who you believe lied to? to you or to your grand jury. He went ahead, indicted Scooter Libby in, very, in a very narrow case, insisted it was just about lying, it was a narrow case, it wasn't about the war. He presented his witnesses before a jury um, over a couple weeks' time. Scooter Libby had a multi-million dollar defense. Uh, he, could, you know, he had all the resources in the world to put up a, 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 any defense that he chose to. Um, he could have called Dick Cheney. He decided not to. He could have called Karl Rove because he claimed in the grand jury that Karl Rove could confirm this Russian conversation, but he didn't call Karl Rove. And afterwards, what happened? The jury, they didn't even take a store vote. They spent seven days organizing all the information presented in the trial and only then started deliberating as to whether he was guilty on these counts or not, and they decided on four of the five counts he was. So uh, I say at the end of the day, you know, bravo to those citizens who worked hard and that the, and that the system did work. It came at a high cost. Uh, Patrick Fitzgerald did go after journalists and put Judy Miller in jail, jail for 85 days, and we don't quite yet know how bad a precedent that will be. And it created a tremendous partisan uproar when you had right-wingers, conservatives, out there, you know, bashing uh, Patrick Fitzgerald and, and really trying to undermine the, the, the criminal justice process here. But at the end of the day, um, I think things worked more or less the way they should have. What do you think? I, uh, to a su surprising degree, uh, uh, I, I uh, concur. Uh, um, I think Fitzgerald has had an interesting, over the last, I guess it's been three years that he's had this uh, uh, independent counsel post. He started out by subpoenaing reporters, and that caused enormous hackles uh, to be raised in terms of uh, Judy Miller and Matt Cooper and, mm -hmm. and um, others who are being forced to testify, and there's a lot of concern about, uh, you know, sort of a rogue prosecutor kind of chasing after a case that nobody could quite uh, figure out. And, and, and again, David, I give you uh, great credit for being able to follow this case for years and years and years, <laughs> including your, your uh, I guess, daily reports from the, 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 the courtroom in the last couple of months. Um, Fitzgerald has resisted, I think, the efforts on both the left and the right to make this a larger case. Uh, the, the, the left was eager to turn this into a referendum on the Iraq War, uh, which they're now confident that they would win in terms of support if they could manage to put an election inside a courtroom. And I think the right, <coughs> uh, the neoconservative right more precisely, has chosen to make this a, a, well, a kind of an alamo for them, if you will, in terms of defending uh, Scooter Libby and the, the Iraq War and, and Dick Cheney and the Bush policy and so on. And I think that a, a proper analysis of what was going through Fitzgerald's mind, and I love the description that uh, Maureen Dowd gave him a while back. She called him a, quote, Irish priest <laughs> of the law, mm -hmm. and he's got that kind of, you know, uh, not overly humorous, not overly light 
sort of Notre Dame Irish Catholic, uh, you know, Spencer Tracy, you know, atti- attitude about him, <clears throat> which, Frank, I, I suppose is what you want in a prosecutor. You know, you don't want a mm-hmm. deep sense of irony. You don't want a sense of whimsy in a prosecutor. You want somebody who, who simply holds all the, the entire entirety, the smart set, if you will, to one standard. When the government puts you under oath and there's an investigation of, in this case, felonies, uh, you tell the truth. What, and, you know, I, I, what I don't understand is the argument on the, uh, from the neocon right, as you put it, and it's not all neocons, but largely they make up the bulk of Libby's uh, defense squad, or what I call the Libby lobby. And... Um, but I don't understand you know, the argument that there was no underlying prosecution, so therefore Libby shouldn't have been prosecuted. I mean, the, the ar- that not only does that countenance lying under oath, which shouldn't be countenanced, but it also re- says to anybody, if the if, an, if the FBI comes knocking at your door or you're put in front of a grand jury and you're worried about being caught and doing something wrong, you may as well lie about it. And if you can stymie the investigation, well, then you win because they're not going to get you for perjury if they can't get you for the uh, uh, for the underlying crime. Uh, I, mean, I don't see how you can have a system like that. I don't think uh, uh, and, and, and expect investigators to do their jobs. Now, there's always some degree of prosecutorial uh, prerogative here, but I think in this case it was it, w- it was a pretty high profile issue in the, uh, the leak and the investigation, and if Scooter Libby had nothing to hide and, and, and wasn't worried, he, he could have told the truth. You know, um, our fellow um, blogging header, Mickey Kaus, was on with Bob Wright uh, a couple of days back, and he said he had a whole theory that, that Scooter Libby lied to keep this thing from becoming part of the 04 election and to protect Cheney. Uh, Mickey was half right. Uh, I don't think it had anything to do with the election per se, because Scooter Libby started lying immediately. Uh, his first FBI interview was in October 2003. That's still 11 months before the 04 presidential election. And, you know, people keep saying, what was his motive to lie? What was his motive to lie, particularly if there was no underlying crime? Well, at the time, he didn't know there was no underlying crime. Maybe if he had told the truth, he would have been charged with something, uh, or, or Cheney would have as well. It seemed to me it was pretty clear he wanted to keep himself and probably Cheney out of the line of fire of this investigation, which Fitzgerald wasn't even in charge of yet. That didn't come into after his initial interviews with the FBI. And uh, I can just imagine the scene. Scooter Libby, you know, is there. You know, the FBI is talking to him. And it's a leak investigation. They're, they're, they, I won't say they're a dime a dozen in Washington, but they happen. And he's just trying to blow off these FBI guys because, you know, you know damn if he's going to say, yeah, I heard about this first from Dick Cheney, and then I passed on the same information that I got from Dick Cheney to two reporters. I told, you know, Carl Rove about it, which is possible, and then Carl Rove confirmed it with, um, with Bob Novak. You don't know when you're a, a target or a witness where an investigation is heading. Um, all he did was he made sure to keep himself completely out of the picture by saying, even though Cheney had told me, I completely forgot, and then I was just passing gossip. It was an implausible story. It was the best he, come up, he, he came up with at the time. He would have been much smarter to, done, to have done what Carrell did and said, well, you know, I just don't know where I heard it from. I don't remember. Even if there's a note saying I got it from Cheney, I still don't remember. So I think it's pretty clear why he said what he said, even though uh, I don't think he expected these FBI duffers to go out and interview everybody at the State Department and White House and get Ari Fleischer on, on, on record all saying, yeah, I had these conversations with Scooter and the reporters as well. I think he was just expecting this to go away. Um, and he gave them a story that kept him, and probably just as importantly, Dick Cheney, out of the picture. And there are plenty on, 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 of, of critics of, of the Bush administration who were openly hoping, and even in some cases erroneously reporting, that uh, Karl Rove was going to get indicted or had been indicted or that Ari Fleischer was going to get indicted. I mean, it seems to me that, 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 that Fitzgerald used uh, that most important of concepts, prosecutorial discretion, to, you know, uh, pick out a case that he could... He wasn't... I mean, no, nobody thinks that he prosecuted Libby for fun or that, you know... And, and, and he, got, he got four convictions out of five, and he clearly had a good case. He clearly looked at the evidence and said, unlike Rove, unlike Fleischer, unlike uh, whoever else... Um, you know, I, I, I've got him here, and, and having uh, having worked in the White House myself for six years, and having been invest, inter, interviewed by the FBI on background checks and even the Iran Contra investigation, 
you know, probably a dozen times. Ooh, I want to hear about that someday. <laughs> <laughs> no, my, my, my connection to the Iran-Contra, uh, uh, it was very simple. In, in, the, in the spring of 1985. You said, hey, Ollie, I have this great idea. <laughs> it's not my, be, you know, territory. I don't do foreign policy, but, but here, hear me out. I, I was working for uh, then Vice President Bush, that's Bush 41, yeah. uh, political action committee, an outfit called the Fund for America's Future, <laughs> and uh, a guy named, uh, who Iran Contra uh, uh, groupies will remember, uh, Carl Spitz Channel. 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 Exactly. Yes! He, he came, made, called me up and made an appointment to come and see me, and he was representing something called the National Endowment for the Preservation of Liberty which sounds like a public group. It's a totally private uh, uh, foundation or philanthropy or, or outfit or something. And came and said, listen, we would like uh, Vice President Bush to do, uh, I, I remember very clearly, a, a dozen fundraisers, and we'd like to raise $3 million uh, for the Contras. And I said, well, you know, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really, we're the political operation. It really is something, that sounds to be something more like for the, the, the formal OVP, the Office of the Vice President, mm -hmm. to handle. So why don't you call uh, so and so uh, and uh, you know talk to them? <clears throat> and that was again spring '85. Uh, uh, two years go by, the Iran Contra uh, issue scandal erupts, and the FBI calls me up and so I was work I was then working in the formal Bush president campaign, and said we want to come and talk to you. You know, and I said okay, well when do you want to come? And I said this afternoon, like right now. <laughs> <laughs> and again, it, it, nothing. Clarifies the mind, or and, and I think, frankly, in a in a in a in a, in a democracy in a small R republic, nothing should clarify the mind more than the opportunity to tell the truth to the government about important matters. And so they they came uh, and they said, Mr. Pinkerton, do you remember meeting uh, Carl Spitz Channel? And I said, Well, yes, I do. And you know what happened? And and they now you they're really looking at me, like you know, <laughs> my eyes moving around, and my you know, sweating profusely. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, listen, we had this very, you know, pleasant but relatively brief meeting where we sort of shot, shot the breeze about the political situation and Iran Contra and so on. And then they threw down, like, a two-inch stack of documents on the table <laughs> in front of a Xerox with a big, huge binder clip and made a big clang when it landed on my, on my desk. <laughs> and what it was, as I looked at it, I said, my, oh, my gosh, you know, there's, I, there's more here than I, you know, I've got a worse memory than Scooter Libby. I, I've... I had a bunch of meetings with, you know, helicopter rides over Nicaragua that I forgot about or something. And, in fact, all it was was just every, every sort of memo and post-it note and notepad and everything else, even remotely relevant to this whole Carl, Carl Spitz channel thing, they sort of threw at me, making it look as I had generated that much paper I had. <laughs> and, again, I, I looked at it and said, well, this doesn't really have much to do with me. And they said, yeah, you're right, it doesn't. <laughs> And, uh, you know, I guess they were working for Judge Walsh, at least yeah, you, indirectly. You went on to riches and fame, <laughs> and, you, you, and you are renowned throughout the land as a good citizen. And well, all because I was, I did two things. I, and it's important for all those citizens out there and people who might wind up with the government. So I, I, I was, you know, proud to work for Vice President Bush and, 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 and then President Bush, and, and still I am. But, and, and I was pleased from my own self survival point of view that I never got involved in the Iran Contra issue in, in, in any way, and then finally, when the when the government came and asked me what I'd done, I told them to the best of my recollection. I never hired a lawyer, never cost me a dime of anything, and uh, I did my little part to just answer their questions. Mm -hmm. this, this, at, at, to, to, as you said, David, the system worked. Uh, you, you don't lie to the government. Uh, we'll, be, we'll be a better country if everybody follows that rule. Yeah, and, and uh, so I still, you know, find it odd that these law and order conservatives are out there now, you know, demanding a pardon for Scooter Libby. Uh, you know, the, the, the ink wasn't dry on, on, on the jurors, you know, a verdict sheet. And they're out posting away at National Review site and other people, you know, calling this a travesty and then declaring that Bush must pardon him. And, and, and the Wall Street Journal said not only should Bush pardon Libby, but, he should, but Bush should apologize to Libby. I think there's a word for that. I'm trying to come up with a word that... C captures that concept. Chutzpah? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. That's how we'd say in my house growing up. But uh, I, 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 and here, let me give you let me give you a theory for you to uh, shoot down if possible. 
I understand part of this is personal. Some of these are just friends of Scooter Libby, and, you know, I, I give people more latitude for being foolish if it's about helping a friend. I understand that. Um, but I also think there's something psychological going on here. Uh, if you're a conservative, particularly a neoconservative, uh, you, you know, the war that you've cheered on is, a, is at this stage a total failure. You've lost the public on this. The president, you know, is, is, is tremendously unpopular, and, is, and is, is the president you once cheered on is a failed president. Uh, perhaps even worse, your favorite guy in the administration, Dick Cheney, is is is, is one inch shy of becoming a, a laughing stock. Uh, last I heard, his approval ratings were at 16. Uh, it was at 16 percent. Would be uh, probably much less if he didn't have a big family. And um, you know, and, and the Democrats are running the show. In, in Congress now, and then you know, and then Scooter, Scooter Libby gets taken down, you know, by in your perverted view of the world, this left-wing conspiracy. Uh, so I see it in some ways as a as a blow to the conservative psyche, and this call for a pardon is a psychological cry for help. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I don't have a good answer. I, I find Libby to be a uniquely kind of unadmirable figure. He was best known to history before his uh, work in the vice president's office for having secured the pardon uh, for Mark Rich, right. who I consider to be a complete uh, no-good Nick, uh, uh, unique in among the history of people getting pardons. He never right. seems to have apologized, never no. showed contrition, has never come back to the United States <laughs> to pay his back taxes. He didn't pay those taxes. Yeah, he, if, he, if he had bought that pardon, it would have been better. I, I, I just, I'm just mystified. I mean, I mean, the rich pardon. I, I always thought that the, the incoming Bush 43 administration should have been much more energetic yeah. uh, in investigating the Clinton pardons, especially that one. Uh, um, and I, and I, then I, then somebody explained to me, look, you got to understand that the reason it didn't happen is because Scooter Libby was the lawyer for Rich, and then became vice president. I didn't know who Scooter Libby was. Right. Until that immediate period, right. I said, "Oh, I get it. You mean to say, to say that the, the guy who engineered what was it, one of the most malodorous, if not crooked, uh, pardons in U.S. history, has now gone on to a position of trust and confidence right. in the new administration?" And strangely enough, the Justice Department or anybody else isn't doing much of anything on investigating this pardon. I mean, that's just stunk to high heaven. And I always had my suspicions and doubts about Libby ever since, and how he's managed to, to, to bill himself now as some martyr to the, and I, I refuse to say conservative movement, I'll just say the neoconservative right. movement, uh, um, is, a, is a mystery to me. And I, look, and I certainly agree that, that in some future uh, uh, Democratic presidential administration, whenever that is, uh, uh, and, you know, and the Democrats gets caught doing whatever the Democrat gets caught doing, and they say, well, it's lying under oath, and special. I mean, I mean, every, every possible uh, uh, mm -hmm. argument that Republicans have used to vindicate Libby, I, there's no reason for the Democrat. It won't make it right. Right. But in terms of the politics, the Democrats say, well, listen, if, if it was good enough, if, if you were there to pardon Scooter Libby, then how can you complain mm -hmm. about us pardoning James Carville or whatever <laughs> it comes to? You? We're speaking just in hypotheticals here, James. I can tell you one thing. James will not be serving officially in any Democratic administration. He's doing quite well on the outside. Fair enough. Okay, James is somewhat of a friend, so uh, the tongue. Good fun here at Blogging Heads TV. We're not accusing you of anything. Right, Paul, we're Bacala, not, we're not. Paul Bagala, though. <laughs> Same goes to him. So why don't we... Uh, well, uh, the other thing, too, when it comes to you know Libby, I will always remember him for uh, uh, outside of the leak for being the guy when Pal you know hours in the in the middle of the night when when Pal's getting ready to go to the UN and make a speech uh, that would be the case for war in which not just most of it but everything in it would be proven wrong and was false. He was calling up trying to reach Pal in the middle of the night trying to make that speech even harder and put even more bad in intelligence in it trying to get how to go on about the so-called link behind, be, between Mohammed Atta, the 9-11 hijacker, and an Iraqi intelligence officer in Prague, which proved to, you know, to have no merit to it. So I mean, you know, this is not a guy who is you know, uh, being a real strong guardian of the truth. Right, uh, which, which only goes to, to, to what, we, what, what I as a Republican fear most, which is that the, the Bush administration's entire, and the conservative movement, at least for now, 
identity has let, let itself get wrapped up in uh, the defense of the Iraq war, right. uh, you know, as opposed to all the other things conservatives could be talking about now. I, I hate to think that's true. And I hate to think, for example, looking ahead, uh, that if, if this case continues to be unresolved or, or is resolved in some way, that, that are the Republicans, are the, are the same Libby, as you call them, the, the Libby lobby, are they going to demand that all the Republican candidates like there's all, all 10 or 12 of them or whatever it is, that they take a position sign, on... Sign the, the Libby Pardon Pledge. Exactly. Libby Pardon Pledge? What, what are they going to put in the Republican platform yeah. in, in Minneapolis in 2008? What are they going to be saying in the acceptance speeches and whatnot and whatnot? I mean, I, mean, I, I think the Libby... I mean, I, I, the, I can't think of anything more toxic and, and anybody who has... Less. Oh, you know, Jim, I hadn't even thought of that. Thank you for brightening up my day. <laughs> I would love to see them. Get, I mean, they've gone overboard already, but I, you know, I'd love to see it even go further. Um, you know, the, the leak case is indeed a sideshow to the big story, which is the Iraq War. Uh, both are important. The Iraq War, obviously, is far more consequential. Uh, what, what's been of interest to me recently in the past few days is that it seems that the party that's being tied up tied into knots about the Iraq war is actually the Democrats, the party that opposes the war, and they've had a terrible time on the House side in the last couple of days coming up with a, with, with a single plan that can keep their caucus together between those who want to basically defund, defund the war right away, uh, Jack Murthy, who came up with an idea of putting strong restrictions on the new round of funding, about $100 billion, and found there wasn't enough support uh, within the Democratic caucus for that because conservative Democrats didn't want to vote for it and it wasn't strong enough for the liberal anti-war segment. And, um, and then you have some you know, conservative moderate Democrats who are afraid of doing anything that can be considered micromanaging the war or, or that can be portrayed justifiably or not as not being supportive of the troops. And after all this mishigas, uh, they released a plan on Thursday which, call, which has a, a calls for Bush to certify, the benchmarks are being met, otherwise a, a withdrawal has to start within six months, and bottom line, if nothing happens one way or the other, they have to start pulling out the troops in 2008. Um, kind of a hard message to put on a bumper sticker, don't you think? I, I do, but I have to tell you that I think in, in, from a purely political point of view, the Democrats are smart uh, um, to not uh, take on the war uh, uh, Directly, I, I have a, a moment of sort of a, a reaffirmation on this sort of cynical view of the situation. Uh, the other night, I saw the movie Three Hundred. Yes, I've is, heard about this movie. It, it's by this guy Frank Miller, who is a, this artistic, aesthetic genius who did uh, um, uh, the Dark Knight Returns. Sort of, the, he revived the Batman right. franchise in the '80s. He made the movie Sin City a, a couple of years ago. He's got this sort of wild, sort of comic book. Uh, garish, uh, over-the-top visual style. He's definitely injected new life into a, a bunch of faded uh, 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 genres. And the latest one he's done is to revive uh, the, the, the memory of King Leonidas, the leader of the Spartans, who fought the Persians at the Battle of Thermopylae in 480 B.C. And... In the course of this movie, he, he gives many, many uh, ringing affirmations of the def def defense of freedom. I'm not really aware the Spartans were all that free, but that's okay. <laughs> and, 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 and a ripping, tearing uh, indictment of the Persians, I, I guess that would be the Iranians today, right. uh, as servile, Asiatic, I'm sure, I'm sure that they use that word, uh, uh, slaves were all sort of decadent and kinky and weird and horrible and awful. I mean, the, the, there's never been a stronger Hollywood treatment of uh, an Alamo-like situation. Because the Spartans, of course, fought the Persians and, and were defeated only through being stabbed in the back. That's a phrase I've used on blogging it before. Uh, um, anyway, he, he, there's nobody walking out of that movie has, if the, if the movie makers have anything to do with it, ha, have any other thought other than support our troops, uh, to die for the good cause is glorious, you must fight evil wherever you see it. Uh, it and this is powerful, powerful, uh, potent stuff for people's heads. And it's coming out of Warner Brothers. This is not, you know, uh, PBS. This is not The Nation magazine. Uh, uh, this is, you know, this is, this is right out of the heart of the popular culture. And... 
I, I think that it speaks to the deep, deep feeling that the American people have that they don't want to lose. Yeah, they hate this war. They don't want to lose. Right. And, right. and, and, and what do you do with that if you're a politician? Exactly. I think the answer is you say, uh, as I think the shrewder political heads uh, inside the Democratic Party have, listen, let's let Bush have the war. It, it, the surge is 21,000 troops. Now, we heard, now it's 30,000 troops. Right. Who knows what it'll be you know, a year from now? Who knows? Um, we will give Bush the rope to hang himself. Now, that, uh, I, 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 I understand that argument politically. You don't want to – no one wants to own – the end of this war, particularly, uh, I believe, you know, that it should be ended, but that also it will be an ugly end, and that there's nothing we can do about it at this point in time. No one wants to be branded the owner of the war and responsible for those consequences. But, uh, but, there, but, but my problem here, and this is why I have my own personal dilemma, is that there's a moral component here, too. Uh, if you're a member of Congress and you believe the war is indeed a waste, as John McCain or Barack Obama have called it, and that it's pointless to send the people in for the surge, that it's not going to work, and that we're, all, we're going to have to pull out, of the, pull out of there eventually, how can you in good conscience send a fellow American over there perhaps to die, lose a limb, and then go back to Walter Reed as one uh, well-known uh, moralist once said, how do you ask someone to be the last man to die for a mistake? That was John Kerry as an anti-war protester many years ago. Um, I'd have a tremendous difficulty sending someone over there. I mean, I understand the political calculations. I don't even think that they're wrong. And, you know, given where the country is, particularly at this point in time, it may be that when the surge, if the surge falls flat and, and goes awry, there may be even more public disgust for the war and will make it more politically possible to end the war without taking on that baggage that people are worried about. But, but putting that aside, if you think this is a waste of someone's life, how do you vote to send someone there? I, I, I agree. There, there is no moral argument for sending uh, uh, somebody to go get killed in a war that you don't think is a good idea. That, that you, that you would, I mean, this is what happened to Robert McNamara. Right. Uh, uh, you know, he finally uh, admitted that he sort of concluded that the Vietnam War was a mistake. I think as early as 1965, and uh, wrote a book, a memoir. You know, two decades, three decades later, saying that, and, and was roundly condemned. Well, if you knew that in 1965, why did you prosecute the war for another three years? Uh, and of course, McNamara had, had had no good answer for that. Uh, um, listen, I think there's a basic, even a, a, a deeper problem, which is that. He, he, almost, almost all the critics of the Iraq War, uh, on the, on, not all of them, but most, uh, uh, you know, on the, on the liberal side of the, the equation, and the, you know, um, and, and just most Americans who just don't think the war has been handled badly without much ideological component to it, most of them basically agree with the underlying impulse of American policy in the Middle East, which is that America has to kind of to set the tone over there and kind of be the overall hegemon. And if, if you think that's the case, that America's destiny is to kind of keep track of Pakistan and defend the Persian Gulf and defend Israel and so on and so on, if you, if you agree on all that, then it's really sort of hard to explain what it is about Bush that you don't like, other than the fact you don't like the way the war actually worked out, but the basic model mm -hmm. of U.S. intervention uh, as needed to to sort of keep the peace and police things and, you know, maintain, you know, a, 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 a mildly pro-American order um, is unchallenged. And I think that's what, I mean, for example, Chuck Hagel, uh, who, who rumor has it is going to announce for president in, you know, on, on Monday. Oh, do you know uh, something I don't? I, 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 rumor. I mean, he's, he's got a big announcement on, Tuesday, on Monday uh, in Nebraska, and I, I, it's hard for me to imagine that he's going to, he's Send a press release to every reporter in town mm -hmm. in giant 48-point type, just to say that he's not running for anything. Um, I mean, who knows? I mean, I, I've said before that I'm, I'm looking forward to him getting in the race because I think I think you'll you'll have this tremendous, a tremendous, you know, tremendously substantive policy debate between him and McCain, Giuliani to a lesser extent, uh, about the war. I, I think it'd be dr dramatic, but also really, you know, quite a, a high level of discourse, I'm, at least I'm hoping, I'm being optimistic here, and quite good for the, for the, for the American electorate, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat. I, 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 I agree. Uh, um, and, and with the, Damn, the, the, we're the, agreeing the, too much. The, the landmines that, the land that Hegel have to walk, though, are one... Uh, so, Senator Hagel, you're a Vietnam veteran, you're a hero, 
uh, et cetera, et cetera. But you want to cut and run. You know, how do you, how, what say you? Yeah. And then their question is, is as, as I was saying, is, uh, Mr. Hedgesakel, you don't think Bush did a good job in Iraq, but uh, tell me this, if there's a revolution in Saudi Arabia tomorrow, uh, true or false, you send troops to, to put down, you know, Osama bin Laden yeah. from, getting, from seizing power in, in, in Riyadh. Uh, and, and I think the answer from almost any American president uh, would be, uh, yes, I would do that. I would, yeah. uh, we would intervene. It's a vital strategic interest of America. And, and if you say that, then all of a sudden your critique of the Iraq war looks kind of, you know, uh, uh, tactical and, 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 uh, and situational. Well, except, except, except the, 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 you're talking about the need to do something. The, you know, the need to go into Iraq was, you know, was not presented as a tactical issue, but as a strategic issue. And as you and I know, they, they had it wrong. It was, you know, it wasn't about, you know, preserving American interests in the region. Uh, the, the, the American interests were, 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 you know, were not tied to, in a, in a, hadn't been tied to for years to what was happening in Baghdad. You know, Saddam was a problem and was, a, you know, and, and it posed maybe some sort of threat some point in the future. But uh, it wasn't a strategic, he, he wasn't the strategic concern, you know, and, 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 the, and the essential concern that they portrayed him to be. Well, I, I agree with that, and I think, I think most Americans uh, uh, do. Yeah. Uh, the, pro the point is that if, you know, if country X were to erupt yes. uh, in the Middle East, uh, uh, under, you know, if you look, if you look at the well, we, CENTCOM mandate, yeah. you know, the, central, the U.S. Central yeah. Command, the Pentagon's, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, regional headquarters, if you will, for the Middle East, it would seem to argue that sort of everything that happens from Somalia to the... To, uh, to the stands, as far, I, if I remember the map properly, is the U.S. responsibility. So we got to do something. So what are you going to do about it? Are you going to just let Egypt get taken over by the Muslim Brotherhood and you know let them build a nuclear weapon and whatever else they do? I mean, that's that's the, 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 we're kind of on the hook for anything that goes wrong in the entire region. Well, the, and yes. I think that the challenge to Hegel or <clears throat> to whoever the Democrats, whoever whoever the Democrats run or, and whoever ultimately emerges as the victor in November 08 and take office in January 09 is going to be, to, to, do you want to maintain this policy, which is becoming increasingly costly uh, for America? Let's talk about another Republican fight. That is the fight between Republican U.S. attorneys, or I should say former U.S. attorneys, and the White House and the Justice Department. Uh, this has been pretty, you know, a pretty big spectacle this past week. Uh, I think it was six of the of the fired and dismissed U.S. attorneys testifying um, together. Uh, in Congress putting out a joint statement accusing the White House of firing them for either for political reasons or to suppress investigations that were uncomfortable uh, for, for the for the White House. And uh, I mean, I got a, I, I got an, uh, an email today from a political reporter in town who said, "Gee, thanks a lot. If it wasn't for you and the Libby." case, this would have been all over the front page. This is a big deal. It's a big scandal. The, uh, the, the Democrats are going to subpoena uh, officials at the Justice Department to get to the bottom of this. And, um, and it really has, you know, the stench uh, 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 of, a, of a Nixonian like uh, scandal brewing here. You know, firing a guy in Arkansas to make room for one of car roads, fact, uh, aides, you know, people who are working on, on, on investigations getting good performance ratings saying, you know, you're being summarily dismissed. Um, now you have, and you have, in the, you have in, the, in the Senate, I'm pointing the Senate over there, and in the House, I'm pointing the House over there because I'm on Capitol Hill, you have uh, Heather Wilson, a uh, Republican member of the, uh, the House delegation from um, New Mexico, and, um, and Pete uh, Domenici, the senator, uh, Republican senator from from that state, um, in, in the crosshairs, because they were calling up a U.S. attorney and saying, hey, what's happening with that prosecution of that Democratic state senator you got going? You're going to have that done by the election time? I, this scandal can go in a couple of different ways, don't you think? I, I do. I, I think this is a, a sort of kind of, at, at least from a, the point of view of a, as, a, as a media scandal consumer <laughs> who, who, who makes no pretense of being a lawyer, or even much of a legal expert, and, and, and unlike you, I have no plans on sitting there for you know with an iron bottom for two months or two years in a trial, you know, covering these things. Um, to me, it, it's sort of at, at the level of just media uh, reaction, sort of open and shut. It's pretty obvious that that you know a, a critical mass of 
Republican constituencies uh, managed to say, look, we, we, we're getting together and we're going to pool our resources and we, we, we all agree <clears throat> that we hate these eight, eight U.S. attorneys you know, scattered across the country and you know, for everywhere from Arkansas to Washington State. Um, and they sort of, we'll, we'll make this as a, a package deal to Attorney General Gonzalez and we'll sell it. And I must say, uh, you know, the, when I read every time the Justice Department opens its mouth, whether it's uh, the Deputy Attorney General's office or the Attorney General's office, <clears throat> and they say things like, you know, this is an overblown personnel matter, as, as Gonzalez said in the, in the uh, op-ed in USA Today uh, earlier this week. I think that the, just from a purely sort of political science or even political sport perspective, uh, the, the temptation for every reporter and every you know crusading uh, Senate investigator and you know uh, you know d dirt digger and muckraker and like that just to come and knock their block off. Not only on the on the actual incidents of, of getting these eight U.S. attorneys fired, but then these are the obvious sort of arrogance of who are you to ask us questions about this and who are you to talk to the press? This is just an open invitation to what remains of the mainstream media and uh, the, the Democratic Party, which seems to be doing okay, uh, to really come and, and, and clobber them. I think that's what will happen. Well, I mean, the, 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 and of course we've had what you see in all scandals, the evolving story. You know, first there's nothing to it. First, you know, Domenici and Heather Wilson said they had nothing to say about this. And, you know, every couple of days, you know, it's the drip, drip, drip. The, you know, the, the, the things shift and change. There was nothing to this, and they acknowledged they fired one guy to make room for a car rove, crony. Um, and, and so you just get the sense that, you know, we don't know the full story. And, if right. you, and I, would, I would make one point, just to connect this up to the, to the Libby discussion earlier, and that is, I, w again, without me being a lawyer, I, su I suspect that it's not against the law to fire a U.S. attorney because you just you no. decide you don't like him or her. Right. Uh, it is against the law to lie under oath to either the government investig the Justice Department or the FBI or whatever, or, or oh, the Congress, for that matter, the Congress. Yep. Uh, and so, you know, all these people who are, you know, these people like you know, nobody's ever heard of who are about to become, you know, public names when they get hauled before, the, you know, some Senator House Judiciary Committee, uh, they really ought to pay close attention to remembering accurately everything uh, and, and telling the truth. And if they do, I suspect most of them will look bad, uh, but they won't be criminals. They'll just look, they'll look like they're just political hacks, uh, uh, doing political hacky things. Uh, but that's a lot better than going to jail. Uh, Patrick Fitzgerald had an interesting comment after the verdict when he spoke, you know, spoke to the reporters. And he said, you know, sometimes when you come before a grand jury, or I guess you could say this before Congress too, and you tell the truth, it removes the cloud. Sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> uh, make sure. So let, let's move on to what I would call the knuckleball segment of our show today. Are we going to be talking about the Walter Reed scandal? No. Are we going to be talking about Barack Obama's investments and whether they matter? No. Instead, you have something else to share with the audience, something that I knew nothing about until you mentioned to me just moments ago. And Jim Pinkerton, that is? Well, that, 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 that China has announced that it intends to put a man on the moon uh, in the year 2022. And why is that of concern or worry or joy to you? Well, I, I, actually, it, it's a source of, of we, fascination. I should, well, I should just say, for people who haven't watched before, Jim is a space guy. I, I won't I, I won't take a guess at how many times you saw each of the original Star Trek episodes, but nevertheless, <laughs> Jim cares about things up above us uh, in space. Sometimes I do, too. And um, So you follow this stuff pretty closely. But I, I, I do. I, I think. Look, I think it is it, it, the, the under uh, uh, the unrealized destiny of the human race is to get off this earth. <laughs> uh, um, I'm totally with. With or without know, the, the polar bears. I mean, that's I, what I, I want to know. I think the polar bears. The, look, the the, the, the more humans leave the earth, frankly, the better off the polar bears. Will that's be. right. Uh, um, and, and, you know, there's no reason to put the polar bears on some place that is unaffected by global warming. I mean, there's the, 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 the poten I believe that the potential to have humanity spread to other uh, planets is the same potential that we once had to spread to other, uh, you know, continents and islands. We've done such uh, a good job on this planet, we just want to take the franchise elsewhere. Well, I, I think because we, because we haven't done such a good job on this planet, it's sort of a good idea 
to compartmentalize. <laughs> just simply say we're not we're not going to put a, uh, the, 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 right mm. now. The Earth is like a giant Titanic mm. uh, with no lifeboats, and if we, if some idiot uh, uh, or or a conspiracy or, or just industrial rec- recklessness destroys the planet through pollution or a bombs or you know or you know Islamic fundamentalism, who knows what would do it? Uh, uh, we wouldn't want to live here anymore, so right. we'd want to be better off. So, uh, with that perspective, that I that I think it's vital that some human beings create a, 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 a matter of choice, if you will, a matter of exit. Uh, uh, I think I, I support anybody, including the Chinese, who have a plan for uh, traveling to, to space. And I, I, as an American, my first choice would be for America to, to go do it, as we did, you know, almost 40 years ago yeah. now. Mm-hmm. And... Of course, once the Soviet Union fell apart, the the, the, the Cold War sort of demonstration effect uh, rationale for the space race kind of fell away, and America hasn't been back to the moon since 1972, and I just think that's a, a, a disaster waiting to happen. And so I think history tells us that the only uh, uh, reliable mechanism for uh, space travel is a space race, and so if the Chinese put a put a, a person on the moon in, in, in 2022, and who knows if they'll make it? But it might be early, for all I know. Uh, uh, that will hopefully rekindle uh, in America and perhaps in Japan and you know India and uh, you know whatever you know whatever other country around the world uh, has the interest in doing this. And that would be the beginning of a process that would get us to the moon and Mars and 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 everywhere else. So I think I'm, I, although I. I don't think I'm under any illusions that the, the Chinese are a serious rival to us. They maybe are a, a big trading partner, but I think that they have uh, geopolitical ambitions that put them very much in conflict with us. I think they have every intention of – every time they read an article in the Washington Post about a, a U.S. war game uh, aimed at China, I think they, they're planning a war game of their own aimed at us. Right. So this is, this is a military rivalry that could erupt – Badly, I think that the the Chinese have made it clear that they want uh, uh, you know, Taiwan back in the fold of, of the People's Republic. Uh, I think by 2020 is a target year that they've assigned for that, and so there, there's a potential for an enormous uh, confrontation. I actually wrote about this uh, you know, uh, for the American Conservative Magazine a, a year or two ago on uh, you know the U.S. You know, what U.S. policy towards China ought to be, and I, and I managed to restrain myself from mentioning space in that particular piece. Uh, but I'll mention it now, and just to say that if, if the Chinese go to the moon in 2022, we should we should as well, well and I, then we I, should plan on uh, overcoming them by going to the, going to Mars, and you know uh, uh, Europa, and you know the, the Van Allen Belt, any place else that's relevant too, because this is what we should be doing. It's good for America and it's good for humanity. I, I know you're very serious about this, so I'll refrain from any references to the lady astronaut who likes to wear diapers. But, uh, <laughs> but, I, but I'm also heartened by the fact that uh, there are some conservatives who will hear this news and will immediately jump to the militaristic position that uh, China, you know, we, uh, that we need to be fearful of China. And, and we, we might actually, uh, that may not be wrong, but we need to not be, not be doing it in a, in a jingoistic, knee-jerk sort of fashion. And um, your uh, noble analysis of turning this into a competition rather than as a conflict uh, I, I salute you for that, and I just wonder what some of the other folks on the, on, on the, on the right, the uh, people like the Frank Gaffneys of the world, are going to do with this latest news. Well, I think there's plenty of people, you know, uh, and probably more on the right, that, that, that think a, a war with China is sort of uh, inevitable and maybe even kind of fun, uh, <laughs> uh, just because some people like war. Yeah. Uh, um, and that would allow us then to go after North Korea once we... we <laughs> <laughs> that, 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 that. Kim, Jong, Kim Jong-il will be toast. Yeah. Uh, um, I think that there's a... Look, a lot of the war fervor, if you will, in America has been drained away by Iraq. I mean, you could probably make some argument about comparing a nation to, to you know, the, 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 the medieval concept of bodily humors, and certainly some amount of war bile has been drained away in the last four years. Um, and yet, it, the, the the war impulse, the the the, the, I, the in, instinct to have a conflict, uh, uh, never goes away completely. 
and as far as it goes up and down cyclically. And I am afraid that there's a pretty substantial constituency in the United States uh, that is actively planning for a war with China. So it doesn't mean they're quite for it, right. but it also doesn't mean they're quite against it. They just sort of think, well, let's just prepare <clears throat> and do a lot of war games and spend a lot of money, and, well, by God, if it happens, well, we'll be ready, we'll, and we'll kick their ass. And I'm not, by the way, as confident uh, as they are that we would win such a war well, uh, uh, or win it at, at an enormous cost. I think the I Chinese mean, are, are kind of smart, and I think they've got a, a thousand-year trip on their shoulder in terms of the West, in terms of the rise of, of, the, of the European civilizations in the, la in the last five or six hundred years. Uh, and I think they've got a r real sense of, of, like, they were bested and ripped off and, you know, that they call the unfair treaties and so on. I think there's an enormous amount of historical grievance in they all, China they toward the rest of the world. <clears throat> and uh, hopefully uh, what political scientists call a revisionist power uh, can be accommodated peacefully in the international system. Um, but I must say that you know the, the, the plan of the current uh, government, which is to incorporate China into the international system by sending all our factories over there, so that we're a rich country full of hedge funders and they're a, a middle-income country full of uh, of thriving industries and factories and engineers and technicians, uh, strikes me as kind of an ominous uh, circum and tempting circumstance for a Chinese militarist to come along and say, "Gee whiz, uh, we've got all the factories and industrial wherewithal. The Americans can't even up armor a Humvee." Uh, why don't we just sort of settle 500 years of historical injustice with a quick strike? Right. And I, 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 I'd hate to see that. Well, you, um, you also forgot to mention they have plenty of more lives to waste than we do in a war. <laughs> and uh, listen, a, 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 a military conflict with China would be, you know, a heavyweight fight. It seems to me we, we, we still have to make our way through Iran and North Korea first. And so I'm hoping that whoever's thinking in those terms, if they are, that they're in the bowels of the bureaucracy and, um, you know, it's purely, well, it, it purely... It cover of, I mean, Robert Kaplan wrote a piece in the... Uh, we'll, we'll find it for the benefit of the Blogging Heads yeah. audience. Uh, it was in the Atlantic Monthly maybe That's right. two years, two that, years yeah. ago. It was a cover story. Our, the, you know, what would we do in a war with China or something yeah, like that? Yeah. I forgot the exact title, but it was, you know, uh, 30 pages of kind of scenarioizing, which I think was enough to tell me that, that in fact, uh, plans, not necessarily intentions, but, you know, preparations uh, uh, for a war with China are, are, you know, pretty far along, and I can only assume that they're at least as far along in China as well, and that's, that's a, a formula for a 1914-like system, which, again, I oppose, I, I don't support a war with China at all. Uh, okay, I'm glad I, we got you clear on that point. Jim Pinkerton's <laughs> against a war with China. Unless, of course, they beat, they beat us in the space race to, to the moon, and then all bets are off. No, no, I, if they beat us, they beat us in the space race to the moon, then, I, then the universe is more likely uh, to be Chinese. To be, to be Chinese. <laughs> and and I, I would say that, that as a human being, uh, I, I would rather have the Chinese populate the universe uh, or leave our planet than nobody. <laughs> but I would point out to the Chinese mm -hmm. and the Africans and the Indians and the Americans and, and the Canadians and, and the you know the Paraguayans and everybody else, there's plenty of room for everybody out there. It w and, and I think the world would be a, the, the universe would be sort of a better, happier place if people had more options of well, that, travel that may somewhere be true. so that the, if the Chechens think they're getting a bad deal in Russia, we'll give them their maybe own. they're better off going to planet Chechnya where they can have the whole planet of Chechens as opposed to endlessly fighting the Russians. You know, uh, that's a lovely thought, but I still somehow think there always will be a better piece of real estate than another. <laughs> and then we'll all still be focusing on that. But uh, I think we have actually decades ahead to talk about this. <laughs> And I know that you and I will come back to this. Okay, very Because good. I enjoy listening to you. But uh, so uh, I think that does it for this uh, okay. uh, edition of Blogging Heads TV. Thank you so much, Jim. Thank you, David. Okay. okay. All right, say goodbye. Bye-bye.